Here we've got the Pittsburgh Modular Tiger Keys. It's a three oscillator semi-modular synth with loads of tricks up its sleeve that might not be immediately apparent from a first glance, like wave folding, a multi-mode filter, a low-pass gate, CV and audio mixer, three LFOs and an analog delay. And it's the big brother of the original Tiger that I reviewed and demoed a year ago. In that video, I explained how it was a synthesis utopia, bringing East and West Coast synthesis together. And I spent loads of time creating this little effect on the filter knob, which I can't do here because I've not worked out how to do it on my new video editing the software yet. If you're interested, I've moved from Final Cut Pro to DaVinci Resolve, and it's been an absolute revelation, never going back. But anyway, in that video, I do go over a lot of stuff in detail, so it's worth taking a look at that if you want to dig a little deeper into the functions. But briefly and in broadest terms, if we frame it something like a mini Moog, it's essentially a three oscillator monosynth. One, two, three oscillators. The mix is here. We've got a couple of LFOs. We've got a filter, two ADSR envelopes, and the VCA followed by this analog delay circuit. And over on the right, we've got 24 HP Euro rack enclosure with three power connectors in there. So you can add anything you like. Well, at least three things or up to three things you like to enhance it however it suits you. But each of these standard sections that we've got over on the left has a lot more to it than, than something like the Mini Moog. All of these can be tuned from LFO rates down to or up to really high frequencies, so. Fine tune knob, it's quite easy just to get them in tune actually. We've got an FM input as well. And if we look at the top here, anything in green is an input, anything in white is an output. And we can see with the pre-patched things, we've got little arrows showing you what's going into where. And also the little green labels on each of these show what's pre-patched in as well. So LFO1 um, is the input to the FM on VCO1. And the LFOs have got two rates. So this on slow at the minute goes from 41 seconds. So super, super slow. And if we hit edit and octave up, we go to the fast mode. That goes to 500 hertz, so audio rates. Let's drop it back down again. And wave shaping. And this is obviously part of the West Coast style. And the wave shaper really acts like a filter in a way. If you... It's changing the harmonic content of the note, isn't it? So that's why this is quite a complex synth in that you've got um, wave shaping abilities that can be or are used a bit like a filter on, on um, West Coast synths. Uh, and then you've got the filter as well. And then you've got the dynamics processor. And this can be modulated, and again, this is, well, this is LFO2. Let's stick that onto audio rates. And this is the source of all sorts of nastiness and beauty in this. You get instant gritty dirty things out of it. Anyway, we've got lots of different wave shapes there as well. We choose these with this seed button. So we go from sine to sine and a triangle to a triangle, triangle and a sawtooth, sawtooth, sawtooth and a pulse and a pulse. So just turn that off for now. So inside all of this, there's just tons. Oh, I think that's random. Yeah, when all four are lit. These LEDs here are used to um, as visual feedback for all sorts of things, actually. But nice that. Listen to that from signs and triangles. Great, isn't it?
add a little bit more delay time. So I think that really covers the oscillators. Then over to the mixer, this is really quite complex. We've got one, two, three, four, five inputs, one of those being a preamp. So um, we get 30 times gain on that preamp. So if we do something like take the, the output of the dynamics, that's the end of the signal chain as it were, and put that into the preamp in, then we can really dirty things up. So we increase the level and the gain. In fact, let's just put this onto a single sawtooth and have a listen to this. Um, so just the one oscillator. So here's your sawtooth. <laughs> so yeah things from subtle to nasty distortion really nice but the complex thing about the mixer is it's an audio mixer and it's a cv mixer and it's actually split into two we've got an output here for channel one and channel two and if you put something into the output of channel one and channel two you're then mixing channel one and channel two separately to channel three four and five or channel three and four on the preamp so if, for example, I just put something into one and two there, we're not hearing the oscillator because it's coming out there. It's going nowhere. And I've got a patch coming up later where uh, channels two and three go through one half of the mixer, channel one goes through the other half, and then two and three come back into channel two and they do, do various things with that. Sounds really nice. Um, but yeah, quite a complex little thing. to run through that patch actually because it's such a nice way of demoing what the tiger's got the sort of special things the tiger's got because an awful lot of it is happening in here so here we're listening to oscillators two and three only and they're coming through channel two on the mixer and the way you do that is splitting the mixer into two sections so channel one and channel two coming out of channel one and channel two and once you put something into there this splits this into a two channel and a three channel mixer so channel three is oscillator three but channel four is oscillator two so oscillator two is going to the input of channel four so the output of the main mixer is going into the filter that's pre-patched internally, which means only two and three are going through the filter now. And you can hear there's an LFO in there. It's a little bit like pulse width modulation, and that's on oscillator three. A little bit of LFO too. So we've got a bit of wave shaping in there as well.
Oscillator 1 is coming directly out into the input of the dynamics module for turn channel 2 down. We're just listening to oscillator 1 now. And that's coming through this. So that's completely unaffected by the filter. And the dynamics out is then coming into channel 1 of the mixer. So channel 1 is oscillator 1 and channel 2 is oscillators 3 and 4. So what's going on over here? Well, I've brought in another VCA and that's so I can control the volume of 2 and 3 with this envelope here because obviously the VCA has been taken up by, by oscillator 1. So... So ADSR2 is sending CV to the input of this VCA here. And the input of, to that VCA is the filter out. So the filter out comes into the VCA and the volume of that is modulated with ADSR2. So just like any standard VCA. And then the output of that is coming into um, the input of channel two. So channel one is the output from the dynamics and channel 2 is the output of the filter. And that allows me to have really quite tight control over what's happening. Other things that are going on in the mix is that I've introduced the delay. And when this delay is turned all the way up, you get all sorts of weird little sounds from it. All sorts of noises. <laughs> really lovely and crunchy and dirty, that, isn't it? Button playing in paraphonic mode. And we do that using this velocity CV mode button. So we can see here, paraphonic mode. So you need to take the velocity out and put it into the pitch of whichever oscillator you want to use as the secondary oscillator, as it were. So I'm using oscillator one. So up here. In fact, in the little track I did, I wasn't using um, the LFO on the frequency of the filter. You can hear I've got something on there. I think that's LFO1, is it? Yeah. I was using the mod wheel output, so let's just do that. Oh, I've already got it plugged in here to frequency CV2, so. Just gives me something else to play with while I'm performing it. Oh, bring in one again. So yeah, in that patch we're using Wave shaping, we're using the BBD, we've split the signal into something going to the uh, the filter and something else going to the dynamics processor. And tying that all together with an external module, that gives us the extra stuff we haven't got to do that on its own. If we didn't have the, uh, the, the visual VCA in here, the additional VCA, and we just took that out and put it into here, we'll get a drone. So we can still play it. we'll need to turn it down to stop. Next up then, let's take a look at the LFOs. And as we saw earlier, we've got a slow mode and a fast mode. 
and we've got a triangle out and we've got a pulse out. But that's not the end of the LFOs. Inside this multifunction wheel, we've also got an LFO as well. If we, I don't know if the camera's picking this up, but you've got five volts, which is effectively, let's take something out of there, shall we? So the multi out, let's put it into the filter in, turn the CV up. So that's five volts. Then we've got, um, and that can be, I should really just go over this very quickly. So there's five volts here. You've got different options for those five volts. So where the five volts are, as in, is it naught to five? Is it naught to five and naught to five or five to naught? <laughs> so if we go up, it's different. Uh, and then we've got uh, LFO. The LFO rate, we change holding the multi button there and you can see it with these LEDs. And this is synced to the clock, this LFO. And we've got different shapes hitting the multifunction and then a different shape. So go to a square. And then this is now the pulse width of that square. So lots of little things in there. I've also got an envelope in there. So this isn't this envelope doing anything. Let's just turn that down to all to zero, just to demonstrate. That's that's the envelope from the multifunction tool. And again, this has got different shapes. So that was the snappy. That's more like a brassy one. And then we've got so it holds it and then drops. But I quite like the snappiest. Anyway, that's the multi-tool, but yet we do get an extra LFO. It's not just those two LFOs, and it's not just those two envelopes. We do have an extra envelope in there as well. We've also got a random mode in there. So we have to speed that up. And we've got different modes on the random as well. Speed up a bit more. Again, clocked to the clock, and that can be internal clock. It can be a MIDI clock. It can be a, um, a CV clock. So yeah, I suppose that I'm talking about the modulation section now, aren't I? But yeah, there's loads more than may first be apparent when you just look at the synth and compare it to something like the Mini Moog. Just tons more in there, isn't there? But yeah, the visual feedback you get from all these different things in the modulation section um, is all via these LEDs here. Uh, so yeah, if you don't have a screen, you've just got to know where you're looking and what, what you're doing with things. So edit and clock is changing the different clock inputs. Um, and edit and local is changing the MIDI channel. Eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, all and then one, that sort of thing. But look in the manual for all that, I'm not gonna go into every single little thing you've got in there, but yeah, you've got um, the number of octaves on your arpeggiator. You've also got the, uh, the gate for the arpeggiator, things like that. And you got to hold.
Okay, so I think that that's modulation done. Um, and then we've got the filter and this is the wonderful Pittsburgh modular, smooth, gooey, gorgeous filter. And what's so clever about this is we're getting no drop in volume or bass as we increase the resonance. <laughs> Let's turn that down. Yeah, I should actually have noticed that the mod tool is the pre-patched source for the frequency of CV1 for the filter, so there was no need for that cable in there, actually. So that's just lovely, isn't it? But you will notice that we're not going into self-oscillation. So it's not necessarily for really screechy acid lines, this. But it's multi-mode. We've got low pass, low pass and band pass, band pass, band pass and high pass, high pass, and then high pass and low pass. So that's um, a not. Then we've got random. But go to the band pass. High pass. So following that are the envelopes, and the envelopes have got a bit of a tension on the previous model. That was the the Eurorack sized, and that's this is the Eurorack size model here, and you can see it's much much smaller than the keyboard version. Size wise, 100% much prefer the the this set this size, the new one. Um, but you know, obviously the the smaller one does have its place and does have its uses, and it's probably more handy for a lot of people. But people did sort of note that there wasn't much um, action um, in the sort of faster regions of the envelopes. That's changed on this. They have changed the envelopes. Um, let's put something on there. So that's all good. You do have to balance the sustain here with the frequency CV input from the ADSR envelope because if you've got that turned all the way up there and you turn the sustain up, it doesn't feel like it's doing anything. But actually, a lot of that's to do with the fact that because you've not got the really high peaks on the resonance, you just can't hear what it's doing. You look at this frequency analysis, turn the resonance all the way up. Let's just drop that down to there for now. Once it goes so high, it's really hard to hear. Well, it is for me anyway. And it goes whizzing off beyond 20 kilohertz. So up there, you don't really think you can hear anything, but you can. But yeah, the way I've been using it, or the way I use it anyway, is to find the maximum with this, and then use that as the maximum there, if you use the maximum. But it's not something I tend to do, actually. I tend to have the sustain lower. But I did notice if you turn the sustain all the way up and the decay all the way up, it moves up to that level, it's weird. And the other thing I noticed on the envelopes is the attack. If I do this. Or is that snap into a decay position, but the decay position's higher than the attack position? See that little skip at the end? But 
that's only because I've been testing them because people asked me to test them. I wouldn't normally do that. I'd, you know, you'd have something like that, wouldn't you? Uh, but just something to know if you're really into your envelopes. In normal use, <laughs> it's perfectly sort of standard uh, behavior. So envelopes, I think, are much improved over, over the Aura Rack version. Okay, then that brings us over to this weird Dynamics processor. We've got different modes on this. We've got VCA mode, Dynamics, Dynamics, sort of like a pulse mode. Um, on VCA mode, it's just the VCA. Forget it's there almost. I say forget it's there, but when you first get it and this is turned down, you are absolutely full mixed as to why you're not making any sound. Turn this little bad boy up. <laughs> Because that's the uh, the CV in from the uh, from the ADSR envelope. Basically, that's in VCA mode. This is your volume knob. Okay, let's turn the resonance off there. Put the frequency on full, maybe. Turn the frequency from CV two off. So we're just listening to the VCA. In this dynamics mode, you can almost think of it as a combined. VCA and filter, both having the sort of um, ADSR2 as the envelope. So if we do something like this, you can hear that we've got um, a filter sweep on that. Turn the resonance up, make it more obvious. Now that's not this filter, that's completely open and the CV is on zero. That's just ADSR2 acting like um, the ADSR for this filter as well as the volume. And that's because the low pass frequency on this is dependent on the volume. Now, if we drop this decay down to almost zero, this response knob is the sort of clever bit. This is why this isn't a standard low pass gate. This is Pittsburgh Modular's little thing with the low pass gates. They were all in the olden days, I suppose, they were all um, dependent on the on the technology that they were built with. And what are they called, vectors or something like that? You can't use them anymore because they're, uh, I think they're unsafe to use. But the time response was dependent on the components, so it was fixed. So each synth or each type of LPG had its own response. Here we can change them. If we open this, just opens the gate, low pass gate. Why would you want it? Well, it works well with arpeggios and stuff. Sort of adds like, um, sounds like it's adding a release. But let's put the arpeggiator on and do it. Then we've got this pulse mode, and this is very similar to the dynamics mode, but it's not really dependent on the ADSR. So if we turn the ADSR down to zero, and we just listen to the MIDI as the click, basically. So edit MIDI mode on. So now this isn't listening to the ADSR, it's listening to the MIDI click. But if we have it on dynamics mode, we don't hear anything because that's dependent on the ADSR. And that's the big difference there. Also, this response time, actually, you can increase it. Let's take the multifunction out and put it into the response in. Then turn the response CV up. I've got this on 5 volts here, and I've got it on the sort of standard 5 volts. So, 0 to 5. So, you've got access to all those little plucky tones. 
that you might want um, or that you might like from your old West Coast stuff. <laughs> And you just have to balance things a little bit so you don't get those double triggers. Or you can use the double triggers as a thing. There we go. Attack on zero, a bit of release. Nice little effect, that. Cool. Another thing I think it's worth showing you on this, if you've got one and you're a bit confused about things, if you plug something into the Dynamics processor, um, the Dynamics input, you're then controlling this wheel. Um, you're controlling the whole thing, so it's not like you're turning this up like it was with the arpeggiator. Take that out. If you're controlling that with something else, you're overriding the response. Turn this down a bit. So you're not getting that punch. So it's another way of controlling it. That's all that was really shown there. And then finally, we've got the BBD delay circuit. And this isn't very popular. It's not the greatest of uh, BBD circuits. Um, but it is quite useful. I like it because it doesn't sound like other things. If I wanted a standard delay, I'd just bring in a standard delay. But it's got really um, the, the the sort of delay times. If you're looking for eighths and sixteenths, and the like, are right up at the top end here. And as you heard before, it's very noisy. Turn the regen off. But I like that. Let's bring in a more standard tone, shall we? So you can hear why it's not massively popular. It doesn't really work with really bright tones because it knocks out all the higher frequencies. But if you're using, I don't know, um, something like this, it's lovely. So it really works well with sounds that don't have all those higher frequencies in them. But it also has all this sort of metallic stuff, like flanges almost. If we turn the regen up, sorry, turn the time down. Let's put it back onto a... Back onto a, a sawtooth. It's almost like a sort of weird chorus in. And you'll notice as I twist it, you're getting like a really nice little chorus effect. So this time CV is really important. So if we use, let's try um, one of the LFOs for now. Let's use LFO one as a triangle. Let's bring that into the time. Let's bring the sustain up a bit. Nice little chorusy thing. So I see more of an experimental weird thing than just that here's a delay. And that's actually why I brought this Mojave uh, from Cubit in there. To add some uh, other sorts of weird delays. And again, I've got a demo in a second that shows me using that to make it really strange, but nice. So yeah, that's like a, a sort of weird chorusy thing. Or... Another nice thing. Mm -hmm. 
is doing stuff with the random on the on the mod wheel or whatever you call it the multi multi tool so if we go into this sort of random just adds a nice bit of weird randomness to it i really like it change the timing on that So for me, the key to the beauty of the BBD is uh, modulating the time. But I get why a lot of people, you know, a bit underwhelmed by it. But I hope you enjoyed that if you did please do subscribe ring the bell and maybe join me over on patreon this channel is funded by youtube ads my affiliate links and my wonderful patrons um over there patreon.com slash starsky carware for the price of some sort of lukewarm nasty coffee a month you get access to patches and samples and all sorts of extra bits and bobs and also do take a look at my starsky car website as well again there's patches the samples the stuff to buy and there's free stuff as well but it's really nice if people do pick up the cheaper bits and bobs even it all really does help to support the channel anyway thanks for watching thanks for staying to the very end and i'll see you next time